Welcome to Summerside Church Online. I'm Luke Cuthbert, the pastor of worship and student ministries here at Summerside. Hope you're ready to sing and that you have your Bibles closed because we're going to sing to Jesus and hear from his word. That is what we are all about at Summerside. God is worthy of our worship and his word has been given to us by the Holy Spirit so that we may know him and come to the Father through Jesus, his son. This is what everyday disciples of Jesus are called to as we seek to make disciples every day. I just want to remind you some tools, tabs, and buttons that help us in our digital auditorium. On your right, you'll see the chats blowing up with love and greetings, and we encourage you to join in and let us know you're here. Introduce yourself. Above that, there are notes with prayer prompts and a Bible app for your reference during the sermon. Above that, you'll see links to our Facebook page, website, giving options, and one that says new here. Click that new here button to contact us and we will follow up and make sure you get connected. For those of you who call Summerside home, look out for the give prompt in the chat and consider how you can support what we are doing as a church. God's spirit continues to work in our hearts and in the hearts of those who don't yet know him. So let's be bold in Christ in how we give and how we live. As we get started, I'm going to read two sections of Psalm 68. As you listen to this Psalm, focus in on the heart of God and our calling to sing his praises this morning. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. Rain in abundance, O oh God, you shed abroad. You restored your inheritance as it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it, in your goodness, O oh God. You provided for the needy. O oh kingdoms of the earth, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord. To him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens, behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice, ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's be obedient to scripture and sing God's praises together. Declare that Jesus is alive, that the enemy is defeated with this song. Please join me. Great is your love. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Mark Cuthbert, one of the pastors here. Thank you for joining us today. When we used to meet every Sunday, we would collect an offering as an important way in which we would worship God. Because when we give to God our money, we're actually giving a portion of our life that we spent to earn that money. That's why giving is a form of sacrifice that is an act of worship to God. We're thankful that many people have continued to give electronically or have dropped off their offering at the church. Thank you for supporting the ministry so that we could adjust our ministry and continue serving people through these challenging days. Did you know that we're serving more people now than we did before COVID-19 hit? It's amazing. Your offerings are allowing us to continue adjusting our ministry so that we can continue to impact many people. So thank you for continuing to support us. We know that some people have had their income reduced and can't give as much as they used to, and we understand that. In fact, as time goes on, some may be struggling financially to meet their basic needs. If that is your case, let us know. We have a caring fund to support one another. Through times like these, just contact the office for one of the pastors or elders to be able to be in touch with you to see how we can help you. For those of us that are blessed to be still working, we need to make sure we do our part to support the work that we're doing to our, for our communities and even around the world with our missionaries. You can support the ministry by dropping off your offering envelope anytime at the church office mail slot, or you can send the money electronically or through the mail. There should be a prompt showing up right now in the chat that will give you a link to the electronic options to give or just go to our website at any time to see the options there. Again, thank you for your support. Together we can make an impact on our community and around the world. Another thing that you need to be aware of is that starting tonight, this Mother's Day Sunday, we're doing the second half of our Bible overview class online. You can join even if you miss the Old Testament classes, but if you're interested, you need to register by noon today so that we can send you an email with the instructions for the class tonight. So right after the service, you need to go to our website at summersidechurch.ca, click on the events, and then click on the Bible survey class to register. Or if you have the Church Center app, you can register directly through it. Now before Pastor Devin brings us today's message, I want to invite you to join me as we pray together. Our Father, we believe that you are in control. There's nothing on earth, including pandemics, that can stop what you want to accomplish on this earth. We're seeing how you are even using this pandemic to cause your truth to spread even more than it did before this all happened. Thank you for moving in the hearts of your people to continue to give so that we can continue to serve our children, to serve our youth, and to serve our adults through these challenging times. We know, Father, that many people are suffering today either because they're affected physically or they're struggling financially as a result of this pandemic. Help us as your people to respond properly to these events and to the people that are struggling. Help us not to be afraid, but to have the attitude of Christ through these times. Help us to be generous and to be willing to share what you have given us and help us to serve one another and anyone you bring across our path so that we can share the love and the truth of Christ with a world that so desperately needs hope at this time. Now, Father, help us to listen to your word as Pastor Devin teaches us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Summerside. I'm Devin, lead pastor here, and so glad that you're joining us today. I was thinking this week about my upbringing, my childhood, and walking through in my mind the number of identities that I kind of adopted at some point or another. You know, first... I wanted to be a hockey player. I wanted to be drafted by the Leafs and bring the cup home. And then one day, as I was reflecting around seven or eight years old, it really dawned on me that I wasn't very good and that that was going to be a real problem in making it to the NHL and hoisting the cup. You know, I did all right, but then when you began to see travel teams and kids who trained in the off season, whose parents were probably giving them a little bit of supplement help on the side, these kids were incredible. And I knew instantly that there was no way that I was gonna make it. You know, after that, I wanted to become a skater. And so I adopted that identity. 
Now mind you, this was a short period from, so maybe like a month, one summer. But I had a skateboard and I used to walk around with it and it looked pretty good. The only problem was whenever I tried to use it, I would just fall horribly. And I was good at the falling part, but even something like an ollie, like the simplest trick in skateboarding was always beyond me. Although I looked good doing it, or at least I thought I did, looked pretty cool. One day, a bunch of big kids stole my skateboard, smashed it and beat me up. And then that was kind of the end of my identity as a skater. After that, it was the class clown. Now you may not realize this, but I did pretty well in that field throughout high school. But the problem was, it was exhausting to always be trying to, to one up what I did last week, what I did last month, dealing with the fallout. Like I think I got suspended in grade 11 and 12, something like half a dozen times. Um, you know, it was exhausting to try to keep everybody happy, impress people, and so eventually that identity fell away. After being a class clown, it was to be a musician. So I started practicing guitar all the time. And, you know, and I really did enjoy it. And then one day, it dawned on me yet again that I wasn't talented. Oh, sure, I can play a few chords and sing along, but there's like a four-year-old kid in South Korea right now that can play circles around me. Right? This idea of identity, and for many of us, we're trying to, or we live our lives trying to find foundations on which we can build our identity, our understanding of ourselves. That we can anchor ourselves to something. The problem is, does it stick? The problem is, does it satisfy? The problem is, does it work? Sometimes we, we build our identity and, and then sometimes we receive it, right? You can try to build your identity, to try to be something, but oftentimes our identity, whether we recognize it or not, is something that we have received. And really, as I was thinking about this, you know, it dawned on me that the identity that we receive really comes from three places. Our parents, our past, and our problems. The identity that you may be walking around with, your understanding of self right now, could have been something that you received from your parents or from your upbringing, from what you experienced in your early years. The words and the messages, your understanding that you internalized. It could be from your parents, or it could be from your past. And maybe there are events and situations, regrets from your past that even today, in many ways, still define you. Or maybe your identity is based around your problems, your addictions, your struggles, your negative habits. You know, whether you are trying to construct an identity or you are living your life out of an identity that you've received, this reality of, of understanding who we are and, and understanding our identity is absolutely central to what it means to be human. And we are not the first people to wrestle with this. In fact, the book of Colossians that we've been studying is all about inviting Christians, those who have trusted in Jesus, to find their identity in Him. And so what we're doing for the next three weeks, this week and the next two, is we're going to be looking at identity from Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, 14, and 15. Because the gospel affects and impacts everything about the human reality. And one of the areas that it's so easy to fail to apply the gospel and to live the gospel out is in our identity. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you just to grab them, to open them up. And we're going to talk about identity and the difference that Jesus makes. So we're in Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading in verse... 
I'll say verse 9, so we can get a little bit of the flow and the context here. Paul says this, Colossians 2 verse 9, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness, because he is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, we covered those verses last week, dealing with this concept of circumcision and circumcision of the heart. So if that's confusing you, make sure you go back and listen to those uh, sermons. Now, here we are into verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. I want to repeat that last line of verse 13. He forgave us all of our sin. Now, foundational here about our identity as Christians, as followers of Christ, is the realization and the recognition that our identity in Christ is something that we have received, not something that we create. Our identity as followers of Christ is something that we have received by God's grace, not something that we have created through our own works. You know, you think about the words that Paul uses here. He says, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive. When you were uncircumcised in your heart, God purified and cleansed your heart. When you were sinful, you were forgiven. And over and over, the foundation of Christianity, really, is the recognition that God has worked in Christ to save and that we cannot save ourselves because our identity is something that we receive from Jesus, not something that we earn for Jesus. You know, truthfully, you are not saved. You are not a Christian because you decided to become a Christian. You are not a follower of Christ because for some reason, you are just better or more moral or have a little bit more internal holiness than your unbelieving neighbor. You know, think of this image. Jesus saw us drowning. He didn't simply throw a life jacket out and say, hey, if you get the chance, put this on, swim back to shore, and you'll be okay. No, we were drowning, and Jesus dove into the depth. And he swam to us, and he grabbed hold of us, and he rescued us. Salvation is of the Lord. We do not contribute. We merely receive it. Most of us would know instinctively or from our understanding of the Bible that people don't save themselves by their religious efforts. But even further than that is the recognition that God has worked in Jesus to save us. That Jesus dove into that cold water to rescue us. So what is our response then to that reality? That salvation is wholly of the Lord. Completely and totally God's work. What do we do with that? I'll tell you what you do with that. You let that truth fuel your worship, your amazement, your gratitude, your awe. Let that be the fuel that burns the passion within you to worship Jesus, to live your life for him, that he would do something so incredible as to raise you from the dead when you were dead in your sins in the uncircumcision of your heart and he comes and he rescues you by dying in your place and he opens your eyes to salvation so that you can respond to the gospel? 
You worship him. You give thanks for him. And you rejoice in him. You know, it's never thank goodness that I became a Christian. It's always thank God that I became a Christian. Do you see the difference? It's not thank goodness as if somehow you made a, a wiser or better choice than your neighbors. It is thank God for your salvation. This is the foundation upon which our identity is created. We receive our identity. We don't earn it. So with that in mind, what does he say here? When you were dead in, the sin, in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of our sins. He forgave all of our sins. And so the first realm of identity that Paul is reminding his audience about is that Jesus transforms us from sinners into the forgiven. That Jesus has worked to change us from his enemies to his children. All of our sins have been forgiven. I want you to think about that. I want you to slow down as much as you are able in this moment and think about the profound truth that Paul is teaching here. Jesus has forgiven all of our sins. Now, that's like Christianity 101, right? If you show up to Sunday school when you're a kid, that's one of the first things they talk to you about, right? Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins. It's one thing to know that truth intellectually, and it's another to live that truth functionally. That our day-to-day -day lives are lived with that reality. You know, it's one thing to say, yeah, I know Jesus has forgiven my sins, but it's another thing to trust that he loves you, that he is for you, that he is interested in you, that he delights in you. He forgave all of our sins and as simple and as elementary of a Christian truth as this is, it is so profound and so deep that I can guarantee that every one of us fail to live this out fully and completely. He forgave all of our sins. Now, this doesn't mean, obviously, that we don't struggle and wrestle with the flesh. Paul himself, Paul still calls himself a sinner, right? He says, what a wretched man that I am. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom, of whom I am chief. Paul recognized his fallenness and his propensity for for disobeying or, or, or being led astray in his own flesh. So I'm not saying that when you become a Christian, all of your sins are forgiven and therefore you never struggle or wrestle again. Right? That's not at all what I'm saying. We will continue to wrestle with the flesh. But hear me very carefully. Our deepest identity is that we are forgiven. It's not that we're sinners. If you have trusted in Christ, your deepest and truest identity is not an enemy of God. It is his child. It's not an object of his wrath and judgment. It's an object of his affection. That is our truest and deepest identity. God has forgiven all of our sins. Every harsh word, every lustful thought, every act of selfishness, every failure to love, every critical thought, God sees it all and has forgiven it all. I can't overstate how incredible this is. We sin more than we're even aware. 
I know for many of us, our sins and our, our failures can loom large in our hearts and our conscience and really cause us grief and frustration. But God is even more aware of our sin and our disobedience. God has forgiven you of things that you don't even know that you need forgiveness of. He forgave all of our sins. So let me ask you, if you're a Christian and you know, you've been buried with Christ and raised with him and Jesus is your Lord and the, the treasure of your heart and you are trusting in him, where have you failed to apply this truth? Where, ha where are you struggling now to walk with confidence about this transformational identity shift that Jesus has moved us from sinner to forgiven. You know, when you think about your past, think about your parents, think about your problems, those things that we, we look to and that we receive our identity for you, maybe it's your sexual sin in your past. Maybe it's, it's an abortion that you had when you were younger. Right? Maybe you ripped somebody off in a business deal. Maybe you've made personal choices that you're ashamed of. And it seems like it's this one area of your life that, that, that you just constantly feel like God is frustrated with you at or disgusted with you about. You need this incredible good news of God's forgiveness in Christ applied everywhere because here is the beauty of the gospel. God does not ignore our sin. Right? It's not that God looks at you, a sinner, and says, okay, whatever, I'll, I'll let it go this time. And, you know, just try to keep it together in the future. He doesn't ignore it, minimize it, or fail to deal with it. Our sin, not in part, but the whole, as the old hymn goes, our sin of our past, of our present, and of our future has been forgiven in Christ. This profound truth needs to be recognized and lived out in every area of our lives because he does not ignore it, he deals with it. Because there on the cross, Jesus our Lord, who did no sin, and there was no sin in his mouth, he was holy and righteous and pure and he goes to the cross and he suffers as our substitute. So all of our guilt, all of our shame, all of our sin, all the judgment and wrath that we deserve, that I deserve, is there placed on Jesus and he atones for and pays for our sin. The reason that you can be confident that your sins are forgiven and that God loves you that God likes you, that God delights in you. It's because Jesus paid for our sins. They are done and gone away with. God could not love you more. Think about that. If this is your best year spiritually, if somehow under quarantine you're just like banging through books of the Bible and listening to praise music on YouTube all day and you know doing your spiritual thing and you come out of this a spiritual giant at the end and this is a completely new peak, new heights, new echelon of your spiritual growth, God will not love you more. Do you believe that? There's nothing that you could do to earn God's favor and affection. There's nothing you could do that would increase his love for you. 
God is not in love with a future version of yourself that has grown a bit and has seen more victory over sin. God loves you because your sin, that which separates you from him, is paid for. It's done. It no longer stands in the way. Our sin has been forgiven. This simple facet and component of identity is everything. You know, if you live your life like somehow you need to earn or prove yourself to God, that somehow if you can just manage your sin better and, and, and be a little bit more kind, then God will love you more, you're going about it all wrong because in essence what you're saying, whether you explicitly can, can formulate it this way or not, if you are trying to earn God's favor through your own performance, what you are saying to him is that Jesus is not enough. That although he died to forgive your sins, you feel this compulsion to add to the work of Jesus. There's no need for that. There's no pressure to do that. You can rest. If you have trusted in Christ as your Savior, and I am speaking here in this sermon to those who are Christians, and I hope that's clear, those who have responded to the gospel, he loves you. And this is what you need to take hold of. Your sin has been forgiven. It has been paid for. It's been atoned for. It's been removed by Jesus. So what plagues you in your life? What areas are you failing to live out this identity? Do you worship God throughout your week with a sense of joy and amazement that he has forgiven you? Or do you live with a constant fear that it's just not enough, that you're not good enough, that you haven't done enough, that you haven't been loving enough. You can let that go because your identity, if you are in Christ, has been moved from sinner to fully forgiven. You are not defined by your past, by your parents, or by your problems. You are not defined by your sin. You are defined by your Savior. This is where we rest. This is what gives us cause to rejoice. That when you turn towards God, He's not disgusted with you. He's not disappointed with you. He's not comparing you to, to the other Christians who are seem to be superstars in comparison to you. Because all that stood in the way, our sin, our evil, our rebellion has been forgiven in Christ. So rest there, rejoice there. And let the amazement and the wonder and the awe at God's grace fuel you to worship and obey him in new and incredible ways. You know, there's a very famous psalm, Psalm 103, verse 12, that beautifully captures the work of God on our behalf. And it says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions, our sins from us. Think about that. The psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't say how far the north is from the south. North and south have poles. There's a limit to how far north you can go. There's a limit to how far south you could go. But east to west... East to west is endless. 
As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. It's done. It's paid for. He loves you. He delights in you. This is what you build your identity on. This is the, the paradigm or the truth that you live your life out of. And this is the truth that I am inviting you to think and to pray carefully and ask God, are there areas, are there events in my life that I have failed to recognize your forgiveness? Are there areas in my life that I have failed to apply the gospel, that I have failed to live out of my new and true identity? Don't put your identity in your, in your job, in your looks, in your family, in your house, in your money, in your popularity, in your kids' athletics, because all of this is going to fade away. Build your identity on Jesus. Because he has forgiven all our sins that he has made it possible for us to be welcomed as children. Build your life on that. Thank you. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love. Yeah.
so much for joining us this morning. If you would like to chat or pray with someone for any reason, please click the live prayer button now. It will open a private chat room with one of our staff members who will answer questions, pray for you, and talk things out. The chat room is going to be open for the next few minutes, so be sure to connect here. More than just letters on a screen, we are a family, so show love and encouragement as you greet one another in the Lord. As we finish our service today, I'm going to ask you to close in prayer. Someone in your gathering, take the initiative or elect someone to pray in response to today's message. Pray that you would live in the victory that Jesus brings, knowing that the enemy is defeated and we have new life in Jesus' name. After you say amen, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Let's pray together.